Let's move on to a new section, the prokaryotic cell. Of all the types of cells that have been examined microscopically, bacteria have the simplest structure and come closest to showing us life stripped down to its bare essentials. There's this interesting experiment where Craig Venter, who uh, was the first person to sequence the human genome, is also trying to make a new OS of the operating system for a new synthetic cell, uh, which would be like designed from scratch. And uh, this is kind of what bacteria is in the first place, but it'd be interesting to see if one could create it um, from scratch by oneself. A bacterium contains no organelles other than the ribosomes, not even a nucleus to hold its DNA. So, so these uh, bacteria don't have nuclei. Interesting, right? This property, the presence or absence of a nucleus, is used as the basis for a simple but fundamental classification of all living things. Organisms whose cells have a nucleus are called eukaryotes. Eu means well in Greek, or truly. Carrion means nucleus. So you're going to see karyotyping, karyo comes up a lot. Eu comes up in a lot of different um, sciences and, and other words like euphemism or something, right? Organisms whose cells do not have a nucleus are called prokaryotes. Prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are typically spherical, rod-like, or corkscrew-shaped. They're also small, generally just a few micrometers long, although some giant species are as much as 100 times longer than this. Prokaryotes often have a tough protective coat or cell wall surrounding the plasma membrane, so it's like they're like two cell walls which encloses a single compartment, which contains the cytoplasm and DNA, kind of all mixed up in one soup. In the electron microscope, the cell interior typically appears as a matrix of varying texture without any obvious organized internal structure. The cells reproduce quickly by dividing into two. Under optimum conditions, when food is plentiful, many prokaryotic cells can duplicate themselves in as little as 20 minutes. In only 11 hours, a single prokaryote can therefore give rise to more than 8 billion progeny, 8 billion from one. Amazing. That's the power of exponents, I guess. Thanks to their large numbers, rapid proliferation, and ability to exchange bits of genetic material via a process akin to sex, they're sort of uh, autosexual, populations of prokaryotic cells can evolve fast, rapidly acquiring the ability to use a new food source or resist being killed by a new antibiotic. Interesting. Let's look at these um, pages we skipped. This is panel 1-1, one, one, talking about microscopy. So in conventional light microscopy, we have our retina. This is our eye, an eyepiece. The tube lens, an objective lens. Here's the specimen that we prepared on a glass slide. There's a condenser lens and a light source. The light path in, a, in this uh, microscope, light microscope, hits our retina. A conventional light microscope allows us to magnify cells up to a thousand times and resolve details as small as 200 nanometers, a limitation imposed by the wave-like nature of light, not by the quality of the lenses. Three things are required for viewing cells in a light microscope. First, a bright light must be focused onto the specimen by lenses in the condenser. Second, the specimen must be carefully prepared to allow light to pass through it. Third, an appropriate set of lenses, an objective tube and eyepiece, must be arranged to focus in the image of the specimen. Looking at live cells, the same unstained living animal cell, a fibroblast, maybe we should start here, or maybe not. So this is a fibroblast, is viewed with A, the simplest bright field optics, B, phase contrast optics, and C, interference contrast optics. You can see the quite different qualities. The two latter systems exploit differences in the way light travels to regions of the cell with differing refractive indices. All three images can be obtained on the same microscope simply by interchanging optical components. Fixed samples. Most tissues are neither small enough nor transparent enough to examine directly in the microscope. Therefore, uh, they're chemically fixed and cut into thin slices or sections that can be mounted on a glass microscope slide and subsequently stained to reveal different components of the cells. A stained section of a plant root tip is shown here. All right, let's look at this fluorescence microscopy. So we have an eyepiece, we have a light source, and then we have a beam splitting mirror. And then there's an objective lens here and of course the object or specimen. <laughs> fluorescent dyes used for staining cells are detected with the aid of fluorescence microscope. This is similar to an ordinary light microscope, except that the illuminating light is passed through two sets of filters. The first filters the light before it reaches the specimen, passing only those wavelengths that excite the dye. The second blocks out this light and passes only the wavelengths emitted when the dye fluoresces. Dyed objects show up in bright color on a dark background. 
Fluorescent probes. Fluorescent molecules absorb light at one wavelength and emit it at another longer wavelength. Some fluorescent dyes bind specifically to particular molecules in cells and can reveal their location when the cells are examined with a fluorescence microscope. In these dividing nuclei, in a fly embryo, the stain for DNA fluoresces blue. Other dyes can be coupled to antibody molecules, which then can serve as highly specific staining reagents that bind selectively to particular molecules, showing their distribution in the cell. Because fluorescent dyes emit light, they allow objects even smaller than 0.2 micrometers to be seen. Here, a microtubule protein in the, in the mitotic spindle is stained green with a fluorescence antibody. So think about that. Fluorescent dyes emit light, so they allow objects even smaller than two micrometers to be seen. Why is that true? It's a good question. Confocal fluorescence microscopy. A confocal micro uh, microscope is a specialized type of fluorescence microscope that builds up an image by scanning the specimen with a laser beam. The beam is focused onto a single point of specific depth of the specimen, and a pinhole aperture uh, in the detector allows only fluorescence emitted from the same point to be included in the image. Scanning the beam across the specimen generates a sharp image of the plane of focus, an optical section. The series of optical sections at different depths allow a 3D image to be constructed, such as this highly branched mitochondrion in the living yeast cell. Pretty cool. Super resolution fluorescence microscopy. Several recent and ingenious techniques have allowed fluorescent microscopes to break the usual resolution limit of 200 nanometers. One such technique is, uses a sample that is labeled with molecules whose fluorescence can be reversibly switched on and off by different colored lasers. The specimen is scanned by a nested set of two laser beams in which the central beam excites fluorescence in a very small spot of the sample, while a second beam wrapped around the first switches off fluorescence in the surrounding area. A related approach allows the positions of individual fluorescent molecules to be accurately mapped while others nearby are switched off. Both approaches slowly build up an image with a resolution as low as 20 nanometers. These new super resolution methods are being extended into 3D imaging and real time live cell imaging. These are microtubules viewed with a conventional fluorescence microscope on the left and with a super resolution optics on the right. In the super resolution image, the microtubule can be clearly seen at the actual size, which is only 25 nanometers in diameter. All right, let's look at the TEM, pretty big instrument here. An electron, the electron micrograph below shows a small region of a cell in a thin section of testes. The tissue has been chemically fixed, embedded in plastic, and cut into very thin sections that have been stained with salts of uranium and lead. That's the usual staining for a TEM. The TEM is in principle similar to a light microscope, but it uses a beam of electrons whose wavelength is very short instead of a beam of light, and magnetic coils to focus the beam instead of glass lenses. Because of the very small wavelength of electrons, the specimen must be very thin. This is 500 nanometers uh, resolution. Contrast is usually introduced by staining the specimen with electron-dense heavy metals. Lead has a lot of electrons. The specimen is then placed in a vacuum on, uh, in the microscope. The TEM is a useful magnification of up to a million fold and can resolve details as small as about one nanometer, which is a billion, uh, a billionth of a, a meter in biological specimens. So we have an electron um, gun, condenser lens, the specimen, objective lens, projector lens, and viewing screen or photographic film. This is a SEM, scanning electron microscopy. Similar concept, except there's a beam deflector here, uh, and electrons from the specimen bounce off the specimen, and there's a detector that interprets it. In a scanning electron microscope, the specimen, which has been coated with a very thin film of a heavy metal, is scanned by a beam of electrons brought to a focus on the specimen by magnetic coils that act as lenses. The quantity of electrons scattered or emitted as the beam bombards each successive point on the surface of the specimen is measured by the detector and is used to control the intensity of successive points in an image built up on a video screen. The microscope creates striking images of three-dimensional objects with great depth of focus and can be resolved and can resolve details down to 3 to 20 nanometers depending on the instrument. So you can see here a pretty beautiful uh, SEM image uh, called a micrograph of stereocilia projecting from a hair cell in the inner ear. For comparison, the same structure is shown by light microscopy at the limit of resolution. Not very clear there. All right, in this section, we offer an overview of the world of prokaryotes. Despite their simple appearance, these organisms lead sophisticated lives, occupying a stunning variety of ecological niches. We will also introduce the two distinct classes into which prokaryotes are divided, bacteria 
and archaea, singular is archaeon. Although they are structurally indistinguishable, archaea and bacteria are only distantly related. Bacteria come in different shapes and sizes. Typical spherical, rod-like, and spiral-shaped bacteria are shown and are drawn to scale. The spiral cells shown are the organisms that cause syphilis. Here they are. Treponema halidum, syphilis bacteria. Rod-shaped cells like E. coli and salmonella. And spherical cells like streptococcus. Two micrometers is the resolution here. All right, question 1.4. A bacterium weighs about 10 to the negative 12th grams. So what's that? A picogram. And uh, can divide every 20 minutes. If a single bacterial cell carried on dividing at this rate, how long would it take before the mass of the bacteria would equal that to the Earth? The Earth weighs 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Contrast your result with the fact that bacteria or originated at least 3.5 billion years ago and have been dividing ever since. Explain the parent paradox. The number of cells n in a culture at a time t is described by the equation n equals n sub 0 times 2 to the t over g, where n sub 0 is the number of cells in zero time and g is the population doubling time. So basically, you would expect bacteria to overrun the whole planet over time, right? But uh, that is not what's, what's happened. And I think we have an obvious answer there, right? Uh, the bacteria don't only divide, they also die. Prokaryotes are the most diverse and numerous cells on Earth. Most prokaryotes live as single-celled organisms. Although some join together to form chains, clusters, or other organized multicellular structures. In shape and structure, prokaryotes may seem simple and limited, but in terms of chemistry, they are the most diverse class of cells on the planet. Members of this class exploit an enormous range of habitats, from hot puddles of volcanic mud to the interiors of other living cells, and they vastly outnumber all eukaryotic organisms on Earth. Some are aerobic, using oxygen to oxidize food molecules, very important, and some are strictly anaerobic and are killed by the slightest exposure to oxygen. As we discuss later in this chapter, mitochondria, the organelles that generate energy in eukaryotic cells, are thought to have evolved from aerobic bacteria, which is a really crazy concept. Let's look at figure 1.11 uh, really quickly. The bacterium E. coli has served as an important model organism. This is an electron micrograph of a longitudinal section of E. coli. The cell's DNA is concentrated in the lightly stained region. Notice there's no nucleus. E. coli is an outer membrane and an inner plasma membrane. So he's got two cell membranes and a thin wall in between. The many flagella distributed over its surface are not visible in the micrograph. This is a whole cell is maybe two micrometers of diameter. So anyway, mitochondria, this is one of the coolest things I learned. Uh, I actually did a special uh, report and course on this concept um, that mitochondria evolved from bacteria. So our mitochondria and our cells now live inside of the anaerobic ancestors of today's eukaryotic cells. Thus, our own oxygen-based metabolism can be regarded as the product of the activities of bacterial cells. So it's kind of a uh, symbiosis. Virtually any organic carbon-containing material from wood or petroleum can be used as food by one sort of bacterium or another. Even more remarkably, some prokaryotes can live entirely on inorganic substances. They can get their carbon from CO2 in the atmosphere, their nitrogen from N2 in the atmosphere uh, or air, and their oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur and phosphorus from air, water, and inorganic materials. Some of these prokaryotic cells, like plant cells, perform photosynthesis. They use energy from the sunlight to produce organic molecules from carbon dioxide. Others derive energy from the chemical reactivity of inorganic substances in the environment. In either case, such prokaryotes play a unique and fundamental part in the economy of life on Earth, as other living organisms depend on the organic compounds that these cells generate from inorganic materials. So there's a whole life cycle that occurs. Um, what else did I want to mention? Yeah, just this idea that, again, our mitochondrion probably came from bacteria. And if you look at the way mitochondria are structured, they kind of look like their own um, little cells within our cells. And they even have their own DNA, which is really crazy. Let's look at figure 112 here. Some bacteria are photosynthetic. Anabana cylindrica forms long multicellular chains. This light micrograph shows specialized cells that either fix nitrogen, that is they capture nitrogen from the atmosphere and incorporate it into organic compounds. We'll label that H. Or they fix CO2 from photosynthesis, label that V, 
or they become resistance spores, labeled S, that can survive under unfavorable conditions. Uh, panel B on the bottom is an electron micrograph of a related species called Formidium uh, laminosum, which shows the intracellular membranes where photosynthesis occurs. As shown in these micrographs, some prokaryotes can have intracellular membranes and form simple multicellular organisms. If you're just joining us, we're going through a Harvard curriculum. Um, the first class is uh, biology, uh, cell biology, and uh, we're wrapping up chapter one, then we're gonna go to a different textbook uh, and do class two of a curriculum of your average Harvard undergraduate student. Plants, too, can capture energy from sunlight and carbon from atmospheric CO2. But plants unaided by bacteria cannot capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. In a sense, plants even depend on bacteria for photosynthesis. As we discussed later, it is almost certain that the organelles in the plant cell can, that perform photosynthesis, the chloroplasts, have evolved from photosynthetic bacteria that long ago found a home inside the cytoplasm of a plant cell ancestor. So you'll see this concept of symbiosis occur repeatedly. The world of prokaryotes is divided into two domains, bacteria and archaea. Traditionally, all prokaryotes have been classified together in one large group, but molecular studies have determined that there is a gulf within the class of prokaryotes, dividing into two distinct domains, the bacteria and the archaea, which are thought to have diverged from a common prokaryotic ancestor about 3.5 billion years ago. Remarkably, DNA sequencing reveals that at the molecular level, the members of these two domains differ as much from one another as either does from the eukaryotes. Interesting. Most of the prokaryotes familiar from everyday life, the species that live in the soil or make us ill, are bacteria. Archaea are found not only in these habitats, but also in environments that are too hostile for most other cells. Brine, hot acid of uh, volcanic springs, airless depths of marine sediments, the sludge of sewage treatment plants, pools beneath the frozen surface of Antarctica, as well as in the acidic oxygen-free environment of the cow's stomach, where they break down ingested cellulose and generate methane gas. Many of these extreme environments resemble the harsh conditions that must have existed on the primitive earth, where living things first evolved before the atmosphere became rich in oxygen. Here is a sulfur bacterium, and it gets its energy from H2S. This is called chemosynthesis. Vegetoa, a prokaryote that lives in sulfurous environments, can oxidize uh, H2S to produce sulfur and can fix carbon even in the dark. In this light micrograph, yellow deposits of sulfur can be seen inside two of the bacterial cells. Isn't that amazing? All right, the eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotic cells in general are bigger and more elaborate than bacteria and archaea. Some, live independent, some live independent lives as single cell organisms, such as amoeba and yeasts. Other live in multicellular assemblies. All of the more complex multicellular organisms, including plants, animals, and fungi, are formed from eukaryotic cells. So plants, animals, and fungi. Figure 114, yeasts are simple, free-living eukaryotes. The cells shown in this micrograph belong to a species of yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, used to make dough rise and turn malted barley juice into beer. That's where you get cerevisiae, right? As seen in this image, the cells reproduce by growing a bud and then dividing asymmetrically into a mother cell and a small daughter cell. For this reason, they're called budding yeast. All right, by definition, all eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. That's why they're eukaryotes. But possession of a nucleus goes hand in hand with possession of a variety of other organelles, most of which are membrane enclosed and common to all eukaryotic organisms. In this section, we'll take a look at the main organelles found in eukaryotic cells from the point of view of their functions, and we consider how they came to serve the roles they have in the life of the eukaryotic cell. Nucleus is the information store of the cell, extremely important. The nucleus is usually the most prominent organelle in eukaryotic cell. Right? The nucleus contains most of the DNA in the eukaryotic cell. This drawing of a typical animal cell shows its extensive system of membrane-enclosed organelles. The nucleus is colored brown, and the nuclear envelope is green. And the cytoplasm, the interior cell outside of the nucleus, is white. The panel B here is an electron micrograph of the nucleus in a mammalian cell. Individual chromosomes are not visible because at this stage of the DNA cycle, or the cell division cycle, the DNA molecules are dispersed as fine threads around the nucleus. Here are the mitochondria. All right, so what is the nucleus? It is enclosed within two concentric membranes, okay, that form the nuclear envelope. And it contains molecules of DNA, extremely long polymers that encode the genetic information of the organism. We talked about DNA a minute ago. In the light microscope, these giant DNA molecules become visible as individual chromosomes. Right? We have 23 
pairs of chromosomes. When they become more compact before a cell divides into two daughter cells. DNA also carries the genetic information in prokaryotic cells, but these cells lack a distinct nucleus because, not because they lack DNA, but because they don't keep their DNA inside a nuclear envelope, which is segregated from the rest of the cell contents. Here's the nucleus, here's the nuclear envelope, and here is before division, and here as we get closer to cell division, we can see that the chromosomes will start to condense and form. So figure 116, chromosomes become visible when a cell is about to divide. As eukaryotic cell prepares to divide, its DNA molecules become progressively more compacted or dense, condensed, forming worm-like chromosomes that can be distinguished in the light microscope. The photographs shown here show three successive steps in the chromosome condensation process in a cultured cell from a newt's lung. Note that the last micrograph on the right, the nuclear envelope has broken down. Mitochondria. We always joke about mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell, right? But there's more to it than that. Mitochondria generate usable energy from food. Mitochondria are present in all eukaryotic cells, and they are among the most conspicuous organelles in the cytoplasm. In a fluorescence microscope, they appear as worm-shaped structures that often form branching networks. When seen with an electron microscope, individual mitochondria are found to be enclosed in two separate membranes, with the inner membrane formed into folds that project into the interior of the organelle. Microscopic examination by itself, however, gives little indication of what the mitochondria do. Their function was discovered by breaking open cells and then spinning the soup of cell fragments in a centrifuge. This treatment separates the organelles according to their size and density. That's what a centrifuge does. Purified mitochondria were then tested to see what chemical processes they could perform. This revealed the mitochondria are generators of chemical energy for the cell. They harness the energy from the oxidation of food molecules, such as sugars, to produce adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, probably the most important molecule in this, in this book, the chemical, basic chemical fuel that powers most of the cell's activities. Because the mitochondria consumes oxygen and releases CO2 in the course of this activity, this entire process is called cell respiration, essentially breathing at the level of the cell. Take in CO oxygen, release CO2. Without mitochondria, animals fungi and plants would be unable to use oxygen to extract the energy they need from the food molecules that nourish them. The process of cell respiration is in chapter 14. Mitochondria contain their own DNA. This blew my mind. And this kind of gives you the evidence that they were originally their own organisms and that we basically uh, merged with them. Isn't that crazy? And they reproduce by dividing. Because they resemble bacteria in so many ways, they're thought to derive from bacteria that were engulfed by some ancestor of present-day eukaryotes. Mitochondria vary in shape and size. This budding yeast cell, which contains a green fluorescent protein in its mitochondria, was viewed in a super-resolution confocal fluorescence microscope. In this 3D image, the mitochondria are seen to form complex branch networks. Look pretty different from what you normally see my, uh, mitochondria as. So anyway, some ancestor engulfed this bacteria that we now call mitochondria. This evidently created a symbiotic relationship in which the host eukaryote and the engulfed bacterium helped each other to survive and reproduce. Makes sense, right? Mitochondria have a distinct internal structure. A, we're going to look at an electron micrograph of a cross-section of a mitochondria revealing extensive infolding of the inner membrane. It's very, like, much like a maze, right? Here's an artist's drawing. There's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Three-dimensional representation of this arrangement of the mitochondrial membrane shows the smooth outer membrane and the highly convoluted inner membrane. The inner membrane contains most of the proteins responsible for energy production. It is highly folded to provide a large surface area. That's where usually why things are folded in the body for this activity. In this schematic cell, the innermost compartment of the mitochondria is colored orange. There it is. Mitochondria are thought to have evolved from engulfed bacteria. It is virtually certain that mitochondria evolved from aerobic bacteria that were engulfed by an archaea-derived early anaerobic eukaryotic cell and survived inside of it, living in symbiosis with their host. As shown in this model, the double membrane of the present-day mitochondria is thought to have been derived from the plasma membrane and outer membrane of the engulfed bacteria. The membrane derived from the plasma membrane of the engulfing ancestral cell was ultimately lost. There's the bacterium, it kind of invaded the host cell, and it just kind of lives now with us. 
as the most one of the most important parts of the cell. These are early aerobic eukaryotic cells, and how they kind of adopted basically mitochondria, which were originally bacteria. 